Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Good to see all of you. Before we begin class, uh, can I ask, uh, Kiran, can you lead us in prayer, please? Yes, ma'am, sir. Yeah, thank you. Well, Father God, we just come before once again your throne, Father God. We want to just say thanking you, Father God, to bringing us, Father God, to, into your uh, presence, Father God, thanking you. Father God, you just give your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that the subject we can understand nicely way, Father God, and apply to your kingdom work. Thanking you, Father God. Upcoming times are meeting to your hand, Father. Take care of every side. Thank you. Almighty Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kiran. Okay, so uh, so far we've been, uh, you know, we looked at the uh, biblical basis and the mandate for children's ministry. Then uh, we looked at the developmental needs of children in different age groups. And uh, the last few classes we were uh, looking at the learning styles of children. Uh, today we will look at uh, the role, the calling and the qualification of a teacher, the calling, the role, the qualification of a teacher. Uh, and after that, we will look at the lesson plan. So for a person to write a lesson plan, uh, for uh, children, it has to be uh, the teacher. The teacher can, is the only person who write uh, the lesson plan for um, uh, the children they are teaching. And hence, we look at um, you know the developmental needs for each age group, which will help us write or prepare uh, a lesson. Uh, will also help us to choose the relevant activities. We also look at the learning styles, and that also will aid us and help us in, uh, you know, preparing um, uh, uh, a curriculum, uh, writing a lesson plan, choosing the activities, and thus uh, being, uh, you know, able to effectively minister and teach uh, children, okay? So all of this uh, role is done by the teacher. So before we look at how to write a lesson plan, we look basically at uh, the calling, the role, and the qualification of a uh, teacher. Okay, so that is what we will look at in today's class. So, you know, I'll just share the slides with you. Just a minute. Okay. So we look at uh, the spiritual need when the people of, uh, uh, you know, uh, why is there a spiritual need? Uh, you know, uh, what is the spiritual need and how do we respond? Okay, the spiritual need of uh, uh, to minister to children. Okay, so when people of uh, Judah and Jerusalem were carried into captivity, uh, the poor people uh, with their children were left behind in uh, Judah and Jerusalem. And uh, the prophet Jeremiah was left behind with them. The rest of them were all taken uh, into captivity. Uh, but the, uh, those who had uh, come and taken them as captives left the poor uh, with their children, and even Prophet Jeremiah was left behind uh, uh, in Israel. Okay, and we see that many of these young uh, uh, children, the small children, the people were all starving, and uh, they were dying because of starvation. There was no food. Okay, there was no not any food to uh, uh, feed them. There was no way of even getting food to feed these uh, children. So we see that uh, Jeremiah cries out uh, in Lamentation chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. So can one of you read this, please? Lamentation chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. It's on, up on the screen. Okay. 
In one of you read Lamentation chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. It's on the screen. My eyes fail from weeping. I am in torment within. My heart is poured out on the ground because my people are destroyed. Because children and infants faint in the streets of the city. Yeah, so we see that, uh, you know, uh, um, Jeremiah is uh, just pleading with the Lord, uh, with the Lord. He's even pleading with the people. He's weeping and he's uh, uh, crying out that, you know, um, that, uh, you know, the, the children are just, uh, and infants are just fainting on the streets. They're dying on the streets because there's uh, no food and there's no one to uh, feed them, okay? Then we see that Jeremiah also pleads with the Lord's people uh, to weep and to pray. And uh, this he does in, uh, we read in Lamentations chapter 2, verse 19. So can one of you read Lamentations chapter 2, verse 19, please? It's on the screen. Lamentations chapter 2, verse 19. Let tears come down like. Go ahead, Ara. Let tears run down like a river by day and night. Give thy no rest. Arise, cry out in the night, in the beginning of the watch. Pour out thine heart like water be uh, before the face of the Lord. Oops, sorry, I just have to put on the next slide. Okay, yeah. Go ahead, continue reading. Lift up thy hands towards him for the lift for, for the life of thy young children that faint for hunger in the top of every street. Okay. Thank you, Erin. So here we see that Jeremiah is pleading with the Lord's people. He's saying, you know, cry out to God, uh, you know, uh, you know, lift your faces up to the Lord, cry out to the Lord, lift up your hands towards him. Uh, so that, you know, uh, he will give life to our young children uh, uh, because they are fainting for hunger uh, at every street. So in every street, every corner, they can just see uh, children fainting, falling down, uh, dead. And we see that even uh, Jeremiah is so frustrated and so saddened in his heart. Uh, he's telling the people that, you know, they are not even uh, able to do anything. Uh, to help uh, these children who are fainting and dying on the streets. And so he, uh, you know, he kind of uh, accuses them uh, for being cruel. And he says this in Lamentations chapter 4, uh, verses 3 and 4. Lamentations chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Can somebody read that, please? Lamentations chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. So, Karnit, do you want to read that? Hello, are you able to hear me, class? Yes, I can hear. Can I read oh, more? Oh. Yeah, please go ahead, Thomas. Thank you. you even jackals put their breasts to nurse their young, but my people heartless, like ostriches in the desert. Ostriches. Yes, go ahead. Ostriches in the uh, next slide. No? Desert. Desert. Because First, the infant's tongue sticks to the roof of its mouth. The children beg for bread, but no one gives it to them. Okay, so here we see that, uh, you know, Jeremiah is basically accusing the people of being cruel and saying that, you know, uh, the children are begging for food 
but there's no one to uh, give them. Okay, so this was the condition of the people uh, who were left back, uh, you know, in Jerusalem and uh, Judah, and there was a great need. And uh, Jeremiah who was there, he was, uh, you know, crying out to God, and he was also telling the people to do something uh, to feed the children. Okay, uh, and just uh, as there was this great need, uh, we see that, you know, there is a great need even uh, today, okay? The condition of uh, the children uh, in our world today is kind of uh, the same when we look at it in a spiritual sense, okay? The condition of the children in Jerusalem is typical of the spiritual need of the children in certain parts of the world today. Uh, the children in Jerusalem were starving because there was no one to feed them. Uh, there was, even though their parents were there, there was uh, no way they could get food. They were not trying any other, you know, means to just get food for their children. Uh, the children were starving for physical food. Uh, but we see today that uh, children in our world are starving of spiritual uh, food. Okay, so... Um, and what do I mean by saying that uh, children in today's world, in certain parts of the world today, are starving of uh, spiritual food? What I mean is that, you know, uh, children, they know God, uh, but they really don't have a personal relationship with God. Okay, so for example, I know uh, who is the chief minister of my state or the prime minister of my country, the president. Um, I know certain people, but you know, I don't know them personally. I don't relate to them uh, personally. So we see that children in today's world, they know about Jesus, they know God, they know about the Bible, but they don't read the Bible, they don't have a personal relationship with God. And uh, so we can say that you know, they have a form of godliness, but they deny its power, just like uh, Paul says in his letter. You know, so children know everything about God, but they don't have a personal relationship with God, they don't have a personal experience with Him, and they don't have a personal encounter with uh, Him, okay? So we see that this tremendous need, there was a tremendous need in Judah and Jerusalem, and uh, there is a tremendous spiritual need in the world today, uh, you know, amongst the children as well, and this tremendous need can only be met you know, if we as God's people, you know, pray just like Jeremiah prayed, uh, and we as God's people also meet the need that is uh, there. So there is a great need, but we just can't uh, say, yeah, there is a great spiritual need and feel sad about it, but we need to do something. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, uh, meet that need and uh, we need to not only just meet the need by praying, but we also need to meet that need by being available, uh, by doing something, by being active, by engaging in ministering uh, to uh, children, okay? We see that the parents were there with the children, but they did not, uh, you know, go out of their way uh, to procure food for them, to get food for them, or make something available by which their children uh, can be saved and not just drop down dead. So even as we see our children, you know, in the world today, uh, caught up with so many things, you know, they have their friend circles, they have the internet, uh, they constantly glued to the TV, they constantly go to their uh, uh, mobile phones, there's so many things on the on the internet uh, and in the media world that they can just constantly be engaged in. Uh, they're getting a lot of things from the world, but, you know, um, we need to get them more engaged in the things of God. So what I'm really saying is, you know, uh, if we are good with media, then maybe we can, uh, you know, do get some videos, we can open up some, uh, you know, websites to cater to children's needs, which will meet their spiritual needs, but they can engage in meaningful, uh, you know, uh, godly activity, which they can learn from, they can see, or, uh, you know, just be available to teach them, you know, uh, just be available to minister to them or wherever there is a need. So we see that even when uh, Jesus taught, he uh, he just didn't minister to adults. We also saw that he had a burden. Uh, he had a heart for children. He took time to minister and to cater to their needs. So there is a great need. Uh, 
you know, we have the bread of life, okay, but who will take it to the perishing millions? We, we have the word of life with us. Uh, we know God. We are, uh, you know, being equipped in the ministry. We are equipped in, uh, uh, in teaching and ministering. Uh, you know, we have the bread of life now, but who will take it to the perishing uh, millions, okay? So uh, it is a responsibility. It's a call of God. Uh, to minister to these, uh, uh, to the children, to the young ones. Okay. Now, children's church teachers or Sunday school teachers uh, are in such a important position. Okay. Why are they in such an important uh, position? Uh, because uh, you know, sorry. Um, because uh, teachers make the greatest impact. Uh, uh, the teachers who made the greatest impact are those who teach the very young. Okay, I repeat that again. Teachers uh, who, uh, who made the greatest impact are those who teach the very young. So you know, when we teach uh, children, we actually influence how they think, how they feel, and how they act. Okay, uh, so. By teaching children, we actually influence them how they think, how they feel, and how they act, not for the present moment, not just for a certain uh, period of time, but it actually influences them for the rest of their uh, life. Okay, So what we teach will actually continue uh, to influence how children think, feel, and act. Now, what could cause a teacher to have such an impact on a young one's life? Okay. Uh, what could uh, you know cause a teacher to have uh, such a powerful impact on a young one's life? The first thing is that a teacher should be well prepared, uh, somebody who employs effective methods. Uh, we all we saw uh, and we learned the uh, the developmental needs of children, so we need to be aware of what is the developmental needs of the children in that age group, uh, how we could, uh, what are their needs, what are their spiritual needs, uh, their mental, emotional, physical needs, and how we can effectively cater to those needs, uh, what is the effective methods that we can use, we learned it through the different learning styles, and uh, we also, uh, you know, uh, it's important that uh, a teacher can make a powerful impact on a young one's life when they, uh, you know, they motivate the young ones. Okay, and how do they motivate them? It is through uh, challenging them and also giving them the freedom, challenging them to do things, challenging them to act on what they have learned, and also doing it in the freedom that, uh, you know, they best like or enjoy. That means uh, according to their learning style or what uh, is their kind of, uh, uh, you know, they, the, the, the kind they receive best, how they receive best, and also give them the freedom to, uh, you know, choose how they are going to act, uh, you know, how they are going to apply. I've already spoken about this, uh, so just basically reiterating. The second thing, what, what could cause a teacher to have such an impact on young one's life is, uh, you know, the teacher treats the children as competent and intelligent uh, individuals, okay? Uh, that means competent means children are uh, not just to be fed uh, milk all the time, uh, see them as someone who's able and fit uh, to uh, not just listen to a story, but also to give them uh, truths from God's word, revelations from God's word, um, you know, give them solid meat from God's word. So what we basically do is within children's ministry, it's very easy, we can just go and, uh, you know, teach a child. I've been saying this uh, repeatedly from class one. You know, it's very easy because we think, oh, okay, I know Zachy's story, or I know David and Goliath's story, or I know the parable of the lost son, uh, or the parable of the, uh, you know, sower. Uh, so I can just go and narrate the story to them. So we'll just narrate the story and then give them something to color. But, you know, we need to see that children are, you know, able and fit like adults to receive a little more solid food than just giving them watered down 
uh, liquid or milk that we can just do by narrating a story. But imagine if somebody calls you to uh, teach, an, uh, you know, you preach in adult church or uh, to do a Bible study among youth or a Bible study for the adults, you know, we would spend quality time on just teaching and um, you know, uh, on preparing, on uh, knowing our subject well, uh, preparing well, having our notes in place, and then going and uh, preaching or doing the Bible study. But uh, sad when I when I see you know when people come to teach in children's church, they think it's just uh, you know a story, so they'll just uh, maybe look it up on Saturday night, just brush through it. Uh, and they think they can say something to the children. But no, children are competent, they're able and fit. Uh, they know when you are well prepared, they know when you're taking the efforts uh, uh, to do what you're doing, they will respect you for that, they will honor you, they will remember you for that, they will thank you. And also we see when we are preparing well our lesson, you know, we are being a, a, a good teacher. Uh, we are uh, honoring God in a way we are ministering to children. And, you know, we would also uh, uh, be very effective in communicating the truth and the Holy Spirit will work in the lives of the children. And also we have to know that children are intelligent individuals, uh, you know, not just give them something that, uh, you know, we think uh, they will just receive and go and we think the job is done, but they are intelligent individuals, they understand, they can learn, they can pick up very fast. So it's important that we prepare for them. And so I'm saying all this so that, you know, we will understand the importance of preparing a lesson plan and spending time in preparing a lesson plan, okay? The next thing uh, what would cause a teacher to have a powerful impact on the young one's life is, uh, you know, that when a, a teacher is uh, loving, godly, concerned for the young ones and willing to share their life with the young ones, they will make a powerful impact, okay? So we basically need to teach them in love, correct them in love, speak the truth in love. And when the teacher themselves is godly, that means uh, spending time in prayer, uh, reading God's word to feed their own soul and spirit, uh, to learn for themselves from God's word. And when they are also willing to prepare uh, and to share what God is uh, you know, speaking through them, even as they prepare the lesson, uh, it shows that they're concerned for the young ones. Uh, you know, uh, we see God moving in a mighty way, Holy Spirit working through their classes. And also it's important uh, uh, for a teacher, you know, to share their lives with the young ones, to share what happened when they were children, what they did, uh, you know, uh, some of the naughty things you did and how God helped you overcome that or uh, some of your weaknesses and how God uh, helped you or your own salvation, uh, uh, you know, testifying of how you received Christ Jesus or how... Uh, Jesus helped you in various situations, how the Holy Spirit led you, guide you. So when we share our lives with young ones, you know, not just the, uh, the, the major important things, the good ones, but also share our weaknesses, the areas where we have fallen, the areas where we have faltered, uh, then, you know, children come to identify with us. They say, okay, this teacher actually knows what I'm going through, so I will share with her or share with him. Uh, they will be able to help me. They will not judge me. Uh, you know, they will pray for me. So, you know, be willing to share uh, 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 their lives with their young ones. We see that, you know, a teacher will make a powerful uh, impact. Okay. Uh, also, when he or she uh, are interested in the young ones, uh, interested means not just interested in teaching them biblical truths, but also interested in their uh, whole life uh, as well, you know, what's happening in school, what's happening at home, uh, why are they looking sad, why are they looking depressed, or uh, uh, why are they not engaging in any activities, uh, uh, you know, what are they shy about, what are they afraid about. You know, so I, I spoke about this mentoring, uh, just one-on-one -on -one talking with children, sharing their lives, sharing our lives with them. Uh, then we, uh, you know, children will know that uh, teacher is not just here to teach me biblical truths and to go away, you know, but uh, is interested in my personal life, is praying for me, is hearing from God and sharing with me what God is saying. You know, sometimes uh, uh, what I do is, uh, you know, I think about a few children. Uh, 
uh, in children's church and uh, you know during a week I pray for them and I especially ask God to lay upon my heart something that uh, you know the child is experiencing or going through and uh, you know uh, and God gives me a word and uh, on Sunday when I just meet them I I share with them what God has uh, done. You know, that really has uh, built up a relationship, uh, has built up uh, a connect with their, with the children. Uh, so they know that uh, I'm not just there, you know, overseeing things, uh, telling them what to do, what not to do, where to go, uh, and handling the whole show, but also interested in their personal lives. Uh, so I share with them and I pray with them. And uh, they are just uh, so excited. And after I see, you know, there's a relationship that is built up uh, with them, which they actually, even after they leave Children's Church, uh, they call and ask me to pray and, and share their life with me. So uh, a, a good teacher will have an impact on a young one's life, you know, when they're not just interested in teaching them what is there in the lesson, uh, but also they are interested in the young one's life and uh, their ministry to their holistic needs, all of their needs, not just the spiritual needs, okay? So we, uh, these are the four things that probably the four things we can add on to this list, uh, what could cause a teacher to have an impact, a uh, powerful impact on young one's uh, lives. So we see that when we uh, combine excellent teaching methods, uh, with a genuine concern for children, uh, they will find it extremely difficult not to learn. So when children see that you're genuinely not just concerned to come and teach them on a Sunday because you have to and, you know, just kind of uh, uh, so-called vomit the lesson plan because you have to teach them everything that you have prepared or there is in the, it's in the curriculum. But, uh, you know, uh, you're also taking efforts to make the teaching more lively uh, by doing, uh, you know, activities, by doing object lessons, by uh, having a small game, attention getter, whatever. And also you are, you know, uh, praying for them. Uh, you're saying, okay, pray for your test. How did you do your exams? Uh, uh, you know, uh, and if they're having any weaknesses, you're just praying for them. You say after class, you know, I pray for you. Uh, so when they see that you have this genuine concern, uh, you know, they will, uh, they will uh, you know, listen to you attentively in class. They will learn from you. And uh, you see that they will be, you know, they will also grow spiritually because you're taking a keen interest in their uh, lives, okay? I think this is not just uh, something that uh, will, uh, you know, uh, impact children, but even when we have a Bible study, we have a Bible study group, or we are pastoring a church, uh, you know, when we do these things, uh, which I just listed the four things, you know, uh, uh, you know, people will come back to church, would want to hear from you, want to learn from you, because you, they know that you are actually concerned about different aspects of their life, uh, personally connecting with them, and they feel loved, accepted, cared for, and they will come. Okay, so it's not just, uh, you know, excellent preaching skills, uh, styles of preaching that is important, but it's a heart of love, it's a heart that cares, shows care and compassion um, uh, uh, when people listen to what you say. And we see that, you know, uh, crowds follow Jesus, uh, not just because, uh, you know, they wanted to hear Jesus preaching, but we see that the crowds came to Jesus because he was healing people, okay? He took care of their personal, physical needs as well. You know, uh, he fed the 5,000. There was no way they could go and get food. It was getting late. So he took care of their physical needs. Uh, he took care of their emotional needs. He took care of their, uh, uh, you know, their, uh, their requirements of uh, being sick or being cared for. He raised the dead when he saw the uh, widow crying, you know, and her son was dead. He, uh, you see that Jesus shows compassion. So people came running to Jesus because uh, he is not just an excellent teacher, but he showed care, he showed compassion, he showed love, he did not condemn them. He also took care of their uh, physical needs. So, uh, you know, uh, as a teacher, it's very important that uh, we are loving, we are godly, uh, we are concerned for our young ones, we're willing to share our lives with them. 
and also important for us to use excellent teaching methods, uh, but that needs to be combined with a genuine deep gratitude or concern uh, for the young ones. And when we do all of this, you know, they will spiritually be motivated to receive from you, to grow, and they will grow in the things of God. They will grow in their relationship with God. Okay? So we see that um, the calling of a teacher is a divine call. Okay? Uh, what do I mean by a divine call? Okay? Uh, you know, when teaching in children's church, uh, you know, basically people overlook uh, children's ministry. You know, if they're teaching in children's church, they think that, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a small thing that you are uh, actually doing. But, uh, you know, uh, teaching in children's church or teaching in, uh, in Sunday school uh, is a very important role. Uh, and why do I say it's a very important role? Because uh, of what is mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Can somebody read this? It's on your screen, please. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. Hanan, you want to read that? Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Yes, ma'am, I'll read. Thank you. Can you hear me, right? Yes, I can. Ah, okay. Uh, it was he who gave uh, some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for uh, works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Thank you. So here we see this is the ministry appointments or ministry offices uh, that people can hold. So God gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, uh, some to be pastors and teachers. Okay. So we, when we, you know, people, uh, when they say they're an apostle, we look up to them. When they say they are prophet, we have double honor, we give them double honor, we hold them in high esteem and regard. Uh, you know, if they are pastors also, we hold them in high uh, regard, we honor them. But when we talk about teachers, especially, you know, when if they are children's church teachers, we think, you know, they're just simple housewives, uh, you know, who just kind of coming and serving, uh, just narrating a story to children. But no, uh, if we look at... Uh, uh, the different offices in uh, that God has called people to in the body of Christ. Uh, teachers are also there, um, and uh, they are they play an important role. And we see that you know all of these uh, uh, are uh, you know works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Okay, so all of these them put together build up the body of uh, Christ. So. Uh, those of you who are uh, teaching in children's ministry, we have many of them in the e-learning platform who are uh, ministry to children uh, 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 for a number of years now. Uh, they're so excited and passionate about ministering to children. Uh, I just want to tell all of you that, uh, you know, your role is a very important one. Uh, you know, people might not look upon you as doing something very important, um, but consider your role as important because it is important in the eyes of God. Uh, and uh, we saw the importance of ministry to children when we studied uh, the first topic, biblical mandate and basis for uh, children's um, ministry. Okay, so we see that um, uh, all of these uh, offices are uh, as important, uh, you know, for the edifying of the body of. Uh, Christ. Okay, uh, we know that Jesus was a preacher, uh, but he was also a teacher, um, and he magnified the work of a teacher. Uh, but he was called uh, more a teacher uh, than a preacher. Okay, uh, uh, so they always went to him as, and called him rabbi. Rabbi means teacher, so he was more a teacher than a a preacher okay what is the difference between a preacher and a teacher what is the difference between a preacher and a teacher
Is there any difference? Yes, no, at least you can type in the chat, please. At least a yes, no, can I hear? Is there a difference between a feature and a teacher? Yes, okay, thank you, Aran. Only Aran, Aran says yes. Okay, thank you, Kiran, yes. Yes, there is a difference between a preacher and a teacher. So, Kanan says, a man who preaches is a preacher, man. Okay, Kanan says, a man who preaches is a preacher and a man who teaches is a teacher. Okay, so what is the difference between preach and teach? Okay, yes, there is a difference. Thank you all for uh, uh, mentioning that in the chat. There is a difference. So, a preacher is basically somebody who exhorts means he urges, he encourages the audience or the people he's speaking to, uh, he reproves, uh, he, that means it's, it's uh, his job to take people to task, to get them to go doing things, uh, to walking in godly ways, godly lifestyles. He also rebukes them, uh, corrects them, and then he uh, you know, uh, elaborates or presses on the point to get it home. It, that means it just elaborates, teaches, uh, preaches uh, so that it, the, what he wants to communicate, what he wants to say, just goes into their hearts and minds and uh, uh, they can act upon it. Okay? Let me read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, where it says, uh, Paul is writing to Timothy, he says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. It says, Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Okay, so the work of the preacher is basically to exhort, that means uh, urge them, uh, encourage them, reprove means take people to task, get them to, you know, do what uh, is required, their spiritual life, their spiritual walk with God, their relationship with regard to sin, rebuke them means correct them in the areas where they need correction, just press home the point so that uh, they act upon it, okay. Uh, but a teacher's primary task is uh, is basically to instruct, okay, so a teacher instructs, that means a teacher teaches, uh, trains, coaches, tutor, it's not just saying something and leaving uh, it at that, you know, but the teacher goes beyond that to coach them, to tutor them, to help them to understand it uh, to their level. Uh, till they are able to, uh, you know, uh, comprehend uh, or understand what you are saying. Uh, the teacher also teaches facts, but simplifies the truth or illustrates the truth. Okay, so uh, a preacher will just state facts uh, and sometimes, you know, illustrate it, but the teacher will take the truth and will try to, or uh, take the facts uh, take the biblical revelations and try to simplify it um, uh, till the child has understood uh, or you know, try to illustrate it in different ways so that the child can uh, understand. Okay? The next thing is that uh, a teacher gives opportunity for questions and discussion uh, you know, so that they are sure that the truth what they have communicated has been understood, but that does not happen when a preacher is preaching uh, to the adult church. Um, you know, people have opportunities later on to email and ask, but, uh, you know, very few of them do it. But when they're basically teaching, a teacher gives opportunity uh, uh, for the to understand, uh, it is this option for children to understand whether they have uh, learned what they have uh, communicated, if they have understood right, so a teacher asks them a couple of questions, uh, has some discussions with them, discussion questions, uh, to make sure that the truth has been uh, understood. Okay, And a teacher also um, helps uh, you know, the person or the class that they're teaching how to apply the truth, Okay, how to apply the truth and looks for responses to it. That means uh, gives them the freedom uh, to choose uh, or to uh, write down or to tell them how they are going to apply the truth that they have learned 
And when they come back next class uh, to ask them how they applied the truth, how was their experience, what did they learn, what did they not do, um, how they can better do it. So this is all what uh, teaching involves. So basically teaching, uh, the primary task is to instruct, to teach, train, coach, and tutor. Uh, the teacher simplifies uh, the facts, the truths, and illustrated, illustrates it, and then applies the truth, help them apply the truth and look for response uh, by giving them opportunity to answer a few questions, uh, getting them uh, you know, into a time of discussion uh, to make sure that they have understood the truth. And then, of course, the teacher looks for, uh, helps them how to apply the truth and looks for response to it. Okay. So a teacher is more than a lecturer. We know that in, in college, when lecturers, they lecture, they just lecture, they just give all of the information and they expect the students uh, who are grown up or big enough to, you know, do assignments, uh, to do their project work, and they just uh, read it and, you know, they will just mark them. But the teacher you know, goes down to the very core heart of a child uh, to see if they've understood it and uh, also apply, helps them apply the truth and looks for response, okay? So this is uh, the divine call of a uh, teacher. We look at uh, uh, their duties, okay? What is the duties of a, uh, of a teacher? And by looking at the duties, we will also look at how it is uh, a divine call, okay? Uh, we look at, uh, in the Old Testament, the ministry of the Old Testament priests, uh, we find the qualifications of a teacher of God's word. So in the ministry of the Old Testament priests, uh, we find qualifications for a teacher of God's word. Now, from which family were the priests who served in the temple come from in the Old Testament? From which family they had to come from? Or which tribe they had to come from? Any responses? Yes, the tribe of uh, Levi and which family? It was the family of Aaron, so the Aaronic uh, priesthood. So only the family of Aaron was permitted to be a priest. Uh, but it's not the same when we look at it today uh, in the new, as uh, the new covenant uh, believers. Our uh, first Peter chapter 2 verse 9 says that all of us are priests, okay, not Jewish priests, uh, but we are true believer priests. Uh, as believers in Christ Jesus who are born again, who have accepted Jesus and who are part of his family, each one of us are priests. Uh, that is what First Peter chapter two verse nine says that we are a royal priesthood. Um, so you know uh, each one of us are priests in uh, because we have uh, we are part of God's family and that is our calling. That is our commission as new covenant believers. And at APC we believe that every believer is a minister of God. So at APC we believe that every believer is a minister of uh, God. Now, what were the duties of the uh, Jewish priests? Uh, when we try to answer this question, uh, you know, uh, when we answer this question, we can apply it to the New Testament truth, uh, and we will better learn, uh, we'll be able to better understand and also learn the duties of a true teacher, okay? So we look at uh, what were the duties of a Jewish priest or the priests who served in the temple in Israel. Uh, the priests were to lead people of Israel uh, to God in a way that uh, you know would make uh, they would make atoning sacrifices, uh, uh, a blood sacrifice for the sins of the people uh, when people came to them with their uh, offerings of. Uh, uh, you know, that to make atonement for their sin or uh, for their cleansing, the priest would uh, uh, be there to, uh, to stand as a mediator to make the uh, sacrifice for them. The priest would also instruct them in the word of God, what God wants them to do, how they want them to live, what God is telling them to do. 
uh, and also the priest's duty is to continually, uh, you know, uh, build the fellowship of the people with God. Okay. So similarly, uh, the teacher uh, today, those who are teaching not only children but youth or uh, you know adults as well, uh, you know, we have a responsibility. Our duty is like the Old Testament priest. You know, we have the gospel of salvation. Uh, we have to teach them the word of God. Uh, uh, we need to hear from God uh, the truths, the revelations, and we need to feed them with the truth, with new, fresh revelations from God's word. Uh, we also stand uh, in the gap, uh, you know, and intercede and mediate and uh, uh, call the people, hear from God for them, communicate to them, help them also in their uh, relationship with God and their fellowship with God. And all this uh, we do through the Holy Spirit who abides with us, who indwells in us, and also the uh, resurrected indwelling uh, Christ who is with us, who lives uh, in us. So, you know, though it's a big privilege for us to be a priest, and uh, all of us are priests uh, as New Covenant believers, um, and also it has a privilege to be, you know, prophets or apostles or teachers or preachers, it's also a big responsibility, right? Uh, we see in the Old Testament that uh, God would hold the priest uh, accountable for the people he has entrusted into their uh, care because they were the shepherds of the sheep. And we see that, you know, we read in God's word, I think it's in Ezekiel where God says, you know, you shepherds, you have not done your responsibility. You have not fed the sheep with the, with the best when they were wounded, you did not care for them, you did not apply your ointments, you did not lead them and guide them in the right path. Uh, and he says, now, from now on, I will shepherd my uh, people. So, I mean, uh, again, God talks about the priest not doing their priestly responsibility, and we read about this in uh, Malachi, okay? So, even though it was a huge responsibility, uh, sorry, it's a huge privilege, you know, it's a responsibility uh, for us uh, because God is going to hold us accountable for the sheep that he has entrusted uh, to our care. Okay, I'll stop here with uh, the duties of uh, uh, a teacher. We'll continue and we'll see how uh, the, the duties in relationship with, uh, you know, with the Old Testament priests and hence we'll see that uh, the calling of a teacher is a divine calling. Okay, it's time up. I'll stop class here. Anyone has any questions? Any doubts? Any comments? No? Okay. If not, I'll uh, stop class here and. Uh, Okay, everyone, thank you for joining class today, and I'll see you uh, uh, next week, next Monday for our next class. Okay, have a good day and a good week ahead. God bless all of you. Take care.